Greetings friends. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to watch your videos, do prayer studies in the Word of God, and study the history of the faith be a blessing to those who are following along. Friends, we are thankful each day for the ability to stand here before you and preach and teach to you these things that we have before us. We hope to be an encouragement to those that are saved, and we hope too that those that are still yet lost might come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Help us, if you would, to spread the gospel to this lost and dying world by liking, subscribing, sharing these videos, especially on YouTube. But we need and desire your subscriptions there that we might increase the numbers, be able to expand this outreach to more and more people in this world, and more people that see them, more people that share them, the more that goes forth to those that are lost and in need to hear the truth. We continue, friends, to show you in the history of the faith of the Baptist people who were known, yes, as Baptists by the time of the Reformation in many different countries in Europe itself. They were very prominent by the time that Luther came out, and they were well known, and they continued to grow steadily. And... Uh, Today we start with the uh, Baptist churches in Ireland. In, uh, in the early Middle Ages, we can read of the Baptists there. And as we uh, start with this. It says, again, uh, this coming from History of the Baptists by Armitage. It says, a few words about the Irish Baptists may properly close this chapter. We have already seen that in the introduction of Christianity, Ireland... Around, uh, around in those large baptismal occasions wherein many thousands were baptized in a day. For hundreds of years, this practice was continued as Irish ecclesiastical history show, and as it is attested by the ruins of several elaborate baptistries still extant, amongst which is the Milfont. Is that of Milfont? In the early Middle Ages, the Irish Christians were amongst the first scholars in Europe, but the Danish and English conquest reduced that fair land to gross ignorance. It was then, as now, largely Catholic, but Protestantism grew under Henry and Edward, his son. Mary attempted to frustrate it by persecuting or by persecution but Elizabeth protected it and under James I the province of Ulster was filled with colonists from Scotland who laid the foundations of Irish Presbyterianism under the treachery of Charles I who hoped for support of Catholics the vile insurrection of Catholics and massacre of Protestants took place in 1641, as the strength of Cromwell's army considered or consisted. Uh, that is, the, uh, the strength of Cromwell's army consisted of Baptists and Independents. When he overran Ireland in 1649, Baptists abounded in his forces, and they organized churches as opportunity served. There is a history, as we are stating and showing in this, and it's far more than what we're giving you. Uh, we didn't try to pull together everything. You know, certainly these books, are, uh, Armitage's book is a very large book, deals with the history of the faith from the time of Christ on up. Uh, so does Martyr's Mirror, and other books that are smaller uh, get more concise and deal with just a little bit of the details that are available. And there are far more writings beyond what we've even mentioned and shown here. But there is a history there. And to those that want to deny it, and they have come on the scene in the last hundred or so years, who, and they being themselves, and it's, you know, speaking of Protestants, here of course the Catholics and Protestants warred with themselves also as they warred against the Baptists. Three different sides, friends. The Baptists and the Catholics existed side by side through the ages, and uh, of course they called them Anabaptists throughout most of that history until they became known just as Baptists. And then they were 
Reformation came, the Protestants came out of Catholicism. They did not join themselves unto the Baptists, but even as they had always been, they continued to set themselves in array against the Baptists and persecuted them, yet still unto death. Even as the Catholics and the, ba uh, the, Catholics and the Protestants began to persecute and war against one another unto death. Three-sided issue here. Not two sides, as some falsely have been led to believe by those who crept in unawares, who were not Baptists in their hearts and minds, but they were Protestants. And they wanted people to believe that, well, we were all Protestants who come out that were as though we all came out of Catholicism when we didn't. And so their history, even though they did not want to accept the historical writings of Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, uh, even others. But that does not change the fact that it's there. And we will, uh, later on, when we get up in the time period when they begin to rewrite history, we will also speak then of those that rewrote, rewrote the history, but of those that wrote the history that they denied. Now, we move on from that to Baptist churches in Switzerland and in the 13th century. Again, being some 200 or so years even before John Smith come on the scene. Uh, again, those that believe John Smith started the Baptists in their entirety are wrong. He started a Baptist church, yes. He started the General Baptist line of the Baptists. And uh, we, uh, we get to that also later on, too, at the time of his appearing and the false doctrines which he introduced into the uh, whole arena of faith itself, and that being of self-baptism. One cannot baptize himself. You have, to be you, have to, <clears throat> you have to be baptized by the proper authority of the local visible church. Waldenses, who survived such unbelievable slaughter from the Church of Rome, became the seed of the Baptist movement, once the Reformation of the 16th century had made it clear that they were not going to be accepted by the Reformers. Yes, the Reformers made it clear they would not accept the Baptists. They would not be a part of them. And they persecuted them just as the Catholics had. But they made it clear they would not be accepted of the Reformers as long as they held to the separation of church and state. Refused infant baptism and also refused Catholic baptisms as well. They neither, their, their New Testament simplicity of worship and congregational government were too simplistic for the men who had been raised in Roman Catholicism. Dr. Christian, giving health to the Contemporary Review, March 1891, as his authority states, as his author, you know, authority states, in, in those places where the Waldenses flourished, there the Baptists set deep root. This statement holds good from country to country and from city to city. Innumerable examples might be given. For long periods there were Waldenses in Calgon, the Big, Har Big Hards, were spread all over the Finnish Netherlands and in Switzerland, along with Rhine, along with the Rhine, and in Germany, where afterwards we meet the Baptists. He also states giving mourning in Baptist history as his authority. And he, he's been mentioned, uh, mooring is also mentioned in the Martyr's Mirror, I believe is some of the references there. Uh, it says that many Bible preachers of the Waldenses became widely known as Baptist ministers and even names some of them saying such were the martyrs Hans Karch, Leonard Mistra, Michael Sattler, and Leonard Kish, who were all renowned Baptist ministers. This from I.K. Cross's book, Battle for Baptist History. 
those who want to deny these things can continue to live in ignorance, friends. But for we that believe the assurance of the Word of God, not just of salvation, not just of the continual availability and preservation of the very Word of God itself, but also of the Lord's declaration that the gates of hell would not prevail against His church, or His, we might say, His type of church. As we've seen in our study of history, the more they persecuted the true churches of the Lord, the more of them they found. The more they persecuted the saints, the more saints they found to come into existence. I firmly believe that as the common masses saw the so-called church states, as they were, persecuting these poor people unto death, that those that viewed them knew that these were a moral, they were a godly people, they were a people that lived certain, by certain godly standards, which made these persecutors look very vile and evil, for they were. So these that were being persecuted, and they were eyewitnesses of that persecution, even as the testimony is of some who were the torturers and executioners of Christians throughout history, that because of the spiritual attitude of the persecuted, that they did not hold uh, against the persecutor his actions, but prayed even unto God for mercy and forgiveness toward the persecutor, that many believed and became followers of that same Christianity, that same Jesus Christ, and even knowing that would bring them under the same wrath of the same church state which they served. Because they saw a difference. Those wicked and ungodly religious leaders that commanded them to go forth and slaughter the people that would not bow the knee to them and recognize them as the authority, people saw the truth in it. That they were not of God. They were, the, they are, they were and are the church of Satan. And people I would get today that people might understand these things. We do not come out of the church of Satan. We do not come out of Roman Catholicism. The truth does not come out of her. She abandoned the truth many, many years ago, in the time of Sylvester. And she became the seed of Satan and apostasy and began to lead this world away from the true gospel and the truth of the true Christ. We go on to read here, Whatever injury the society sustained by persecution must have been in some measure repaid by the corresponding class coming unto Germany out of Italy in the early part of the 13th century, 1210 A.D. These Baptists, with others, who had previously settled, became known by the, appla known by the appellation of brethren of the free spirit, our beggars, it was no uncommon thing in those day, in those dark times, to reproach persons for their devotional conduct as Malaysians, Ethiopes, Bogomites, and Begards, meaning persons of prayer, which in our view confers on such persons the meed of praise. These occasions from Italy with numbers of Albigenses who escaped the sword and flames in Languedoc, taking refuge in Germany, will account for the prominence of the Begards in the histories of those times and the establishment of their reputation at, the, at this period. They first appeared as a religious body so early as the 11th century, probably, probably from the labors of these men already mentioned in 12, uh, not 12, but 1025 A.D. out of Italy, but came more particularly into reputation during this century. Their primitive establishment, says Machine, was undoubtedly the effect of virtuous dispositions and upright intentions, a certain number of pious women, both virgins and widows, in order to maintain their integrity 
and preserve their pr principles from the contagion of vicious and corrupt age, of a, of a vicious and corrupt age, formed themselves into societies, each of which had a fixed place of residence and was under the ins inspection and government of a female head. Here they divided their time between exercises of devotion and works of honest industry, reserving to themselves the liberty to entertain into a state of matrimony or quitting the establishment. Whenever they thought proper, all those who made itch, itch, extraordinary professions of piety and devotion were called Bidgins. The first society of this kind of which any account exists as and uh, this even this being a group of women this is not talking about nuns now or those who are associated with Catholicism but it's talking about Christian women outside of their realm of influence not part of their organization whatsoever but would be associated with an independent line of thought and serving God rather than man and that even though many of the, you have to realize many men being uh, perhaps killed in wars or being the ones who primarily are maybe put to death and maybe their wives and young women at times left behind women coming together knowing the truth and this being as it says first mentioned such a, a society existing outside of any other religious body is again not being nuns not being part of Catholicism but they being influenced by these that are known as Baptists who came and preached the truth in those days as they time went on. It goes on to say here, the first society of this kind, again, of which any account exists, was formed in the beginning of this century, 1226 A.D., and was followed by some institutions of like nature in France, Germany, Flanders, Holland, that towards the middle of this century there were, uh, there was scattered, uh, not scattered, there was scarcely a city of any note which had not its uh, uh, not its uh, gunnage or vineyard. Uh, then it's got a Bible verse, Psalms, uh, something here. It's all in Roman numerals. But uh, we'll have that notes down there and something else continued from another portion, I think. But it goes on to say, this example of the women was followed by corresponding instructions from men, or for, uh, for, yeah, for men, and those pious persons were in the style of the age called bugards or bug, uh, buggins, and by a corruption of that term used among the Flemish and Dutch bogards, uh, but from others at an after period they were de denominated Lollards. And there are many names that we find and have seen in this history study that re that are pointing to the independent believers, independent bodies of believers that profess to be Christians, that held to certain standards and beliefs set before us in the Word of God that we as Baptists continue to hold to today. And uh, even though these this portion speaks of women, uh, that does not uh, uh, take away from the fact that there were uh, proper, organized, and existing churches also during these times as well that were in existence along with this that were, again, I believe properly as God sent forth men into this world to preach the Word of God and to pastor these churches. Now, moving on here, as we have still some time left, Baptist churches in Scotland and more. There are distinct pre-Reformation traces of Baptist principles and practices in Scotland. Councils were held at Path, a Parth, in the year 1242 and 1296, the canons of which require that in baptism, before the immersion of aforesaid words should be pronounced in, in Holrud Chapel, was a brazen font in which the children of the Scottish monarchs were dipped. 
which was removed by the English in 1544 and destroyed in the time of Cromwell. The Edinburgh Encyclopedia states that the sprinkling was never practiced in Scotland in orderly cases till 1559. Think about that. Before 1559, it was all immersion. Baptism, according to scriptures. When it was introduced from Geneva, many of Cromwell's army, which, sent, which went to Scotland in 1650 under command of Monk, were baptized, who kept up religious worship in their camps and immersed with the convert and, and, and immersed the converted soldiers. Again, and, uh, this being part of history, and uh, when, we're, when we get into that too, we see a changing of mind in the overall scheme of this, and that is the idea that many Baptists were a part of Cromwell's army. And the Baptists that were coming, and that the were in England, and a part of it coming out of it, were having a different mindset as far as force, you might say, and uh, being willing to be a part of a uh, combat, or being part of uh, the military even in this sense, uh, yes, historically, many of the believers in these different sects we have seen have been non-violent and even to the point that they were not willing to yield themselves to the authority of a nation that was over them to be part of a military structure that would defend the nation and their homes and the families. But even though, brethren, I do believe, that, yes, as individuals, we may yield our lives to persecution and there are many that may find themselves put to death even as they have in the past. That as a man, as a husband, as a dad, I have, I believe, a God-given responsibility to provide for my family, not only the, the, the means to live as far as food, clothing, and shelter, but also I believe I have a responsibility to provide protection for them, especially the young, the children. Those that would do harm unto children are ungodly, evil people that have no hope of salvation you know, as uh, the Word of God says, if you had harm a child, it would be better that you never been born. And uh, so I think it's a serious thing. And it, uh, there is a difference between being persecuted personally for your faith and your family being threatened with physical harm and death and taking action to defend them. So, but we just see that mindset that is upon the Baptists in England and this in uh, that time period and Cromwell and they being a large part of Cromwell's army, and also being able to go forth then as they go with that army and spread the gospel and preach the gospel and baptize and establish churches. That's all a part of this history too. Uh, it goes on here to say then, the churches formed at this early period were branches from the great body of Albertenses and Waldensian. Anti-Peel anti Baptists, or Anabaptists, or uh, that were also becoming known as Baptists. Or, and the Pedo Baptists means the child baptizers, baby baptizers. They were anti-Pedo Baptists. They were against baptizing babies and children that were too young yet to understand what sin was and understand the necessity of faith and belief in Christ to be saved. It goes on to say, which were preserved through the successive ages, retaining much of their original character and creed. They are said to have lived as peaceable in inhabitants, particularly in Flanders, Holland, and Zealand, interfering neither with the church nor state affairs. And by this, it is speaking of the government and the church state type of thing, uh, because God's churches have always been independent one of another. Now, they may counsel one another. They, even as we see examples in the Bible of the apostles from Jerusalem going to the other churches, even Gentile churches where Paul had established, we see examples of the apostles going to confirm them in the faith to make sure what they're standing for and to counsel them in regards to those who came into them professing to have come from Jerusalem. They come in troubling them, telling them they need to do things that were not according to Scripture, not according to the understanding at that time. Even as they spoke, of, well, they tell them you must needs be circumcised to be saved. And you must keep the whole law to be saved. 
Paul and the, uh, the other apostles deal with that in the book of Acts. And uh, uh, friends, I put baptism in that same category. That those who would enter in and say, oh, you must be baptized to be saved are the same as those Pharisees who entered in and said, oh, you must be circumcised to be saved. They are provoking the people. They are putting a yoke about them. And they are they're provoking God. Because that is not what the Word of God teaches at all. And that is not what the gospel, of, the, the gospel which Christ preached was repent and believe and you'll be saved. Not repent, believe, and be baptized, you'll be saved. Now, uh, here again goes on to say, talking about that they did not uh, interfere with these churches or states. It says their manner of life was simple and exemplary. They, like their ancestors in the valleys, sought to regulate their conduct by Christ's sermon on the mount. And that from the history of Baptist by Orchard. Friends, uh, and I, I know a lot of some of the different groups of believers we've seen in the history have focused on maybe the writings of Paul. Some sit and look at the like the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes there, and make, uh, talk about that being the focus of their uh, faith. But we all know that all of the Word of God that was available to them is what they would have looked to for understanding. And not just the New Testament, my friends, but the Old. Uh, it has all been given unto us of God. And uh, we look to this here in the sense that uh, I know I see these out there today. When you quote an Old Testament verse, uh, you may get a remark like, well, that was given to the Jews. And I know that some time ago, many years ago, there were those who began to lay the Old Testament aside and say, well, we don't need to worry about that anymore. We just need to preach the New Testament. And, well, we just need to preach the gospel, even some would say. And there are even those today that uh, look at anything before the book of Romans as though it's not really needful to talk about it or to present it. But brethren, beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation is all the word of God and is all there for instruction and, and righteousness to us. The examples that are set before us in the Old Testament are very much needed to be preached in our churches. How that God hath worked how that God hath created all things, how that God is the one who chose a nation of people, not even a nation. He chose a man out from the midst of a people and said, I will make a great people of you. I'll make a great nation of you. And I'll make you a blessing unto all the nations of the world even. God chose him. God chose that nation of Israel. And we see the assurance of that set before us throughout the word of God that, my friends, I have this assurance that God, before the foundation of the world, chose to save me from my sins. And he wrote my name down then. You find that plainly stated in the Word of God, that the names of those that are saved are written down in the book of life before the foundation of the world. Not after, not at the time you believe, but already before. Oh, some of you have degraded God down to something who does not know or uh, not able to understand or bring any unto him because he's so bound up by your opinions. But God is able to save unto the uttermost, and he, even as it says, who sir will. Who sir will. God knows who will come unto him. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. Friends, we're out of time. We will pick this back up next time as we still have a few more pages to deal with the history of the Baptist before the Reformation and even proceeding from that. May God bless and keep you, my friends, till we meet again.